All right, everybody. So we're ready to start. And uh, how many Desmond Nine students are here? Raise your hands. Woohoo! Welcome, welcome. It's always such a pleasure to see physical flesh people in my asynchronous class. <laughs> welcome for, to the class with honor students who are here for this lecture, actually. Uh, and we're going through different topics every week. Last week we had uh, a talk and an exhibition by Hannah Landaker, professor of sociology who looked at um, food and worked with her students on how chemical companies advertise to food companies, what we don't see in the background. Uh, we're gonna shift gears and talk about sound and uh, our featured artist is Ivan Adama who will speak in a minute but because it is in class context I will give a little bit more of a sense of where I go with this topic and and how Ivan actually is approaching it will make more sense in fact. Uh, this is also related to our four-year research now for the Getty Pacific Standard Project which is called Atmosphere of Sound, Sonic Arts in Times of Climate Disruption. So we've been for four years really deeply into it, and I just wanted to give a little bit of a sense of what we're talking about. So when we're talking about sound, we are talking about vibrations, and that includes even vibrations of what we don't hear. Human senses are incredibly narrow, so what we don't hear and don't see is a, like a huge territory where it's just this narrow in many ways uh, other than just uh, in senses. And uh, what I'm interested in is not what we hear so much, although that too, but a kind of an energetic cellular listening of what we feel, what, what we sense that is beyond hearing. So that would be covering molecular and cellular vibrations, brain waves that are happening now in this room, um, human voice and animal voice and how we affect each other through our voice, how we think of even our body as an instrument um, and how we work with air, with um, breathing. And then finally the environment the weather and even into space. So space is considered silent, but not really, if we think about different ways of looking at it. So just again, just kind of a run through. A picture may be worth a thousand words, but a soundscape is, is worth a thousand pictures. I love this quote by Bernie Krauss, who if you dig into, and we'll have links in the class, is a wonderful, um, person who's been working on a, a project called Great Animal Orchestra in a book that I highly recommend. He spent his life discovering and listening to nature. And so we came from Royce Hall, the honors class, and I gave the class half an hour to come here rather than 10 minutes. But they were asked not to speak and to actually look around and listen. Uh, and that was very much what Bernie Krauss was doing and really showing how illiterate we've become. So this I won't play, but I will have a link. Um, the signal frequency of what we don't hear, so you actually go through a lot that we don't hear, and then we hear something, and then it gets pretty destructive. I'm showing this also because uh, even though we'll talk about the destructive noise, and then destructive noise that we don't hear, which is very pertinent to the times we're living in now. So even though we are not hearing a lot of the violence that's going on, we are sensing it. And of course, with all the media, we're having like a double stress about it. Um, and then there's brain waves, and we have a little bit of a list here about how the audible sounds are measured in hertz. So that's particular waves. And then inside the heartbeat, um, you also have different ways that your heartbeat is measuring sound and it's a rhythm. And uh, there's artists who actually work with heartbeat as the rhythm, as a drum. The pulse is of course a rhythm and you can, you can um, even diagnose sicknesses, especially in uh, Chinese and Tibetan medicine through a pulse, they can discover a lot. Digestive rhythms, 
circadian rhythms that are related to, um, to nature, of course, and then menstrual for women and the connection of that, brain waves, and just the general idea of um, every cell having a rhythm. So then we expand out to thinking of the rhythm of the earth, the moon, and the sun, and further spatial so that we actually um, uh, understand that when you have anxiety, it really means that you're out of sync. And isolation is the first kind of way to create anxiety because we're group animals. Uh, so I'm going to just stop there because I could keep going. Uh, and this is a subject that's very dear to my heart. But I will say that uh, this talk by even that to me is very interesting at this particular point. Uh, she told me a story of um, how when she was a young girl in Belgrade, when there was the bombing of Belgrade, uh, she was in the, uh, under like three floors down in uh, the bomb shelter. And the parents made sure that the kids played and had no idea about what's going on. So as far as she remembers, she never heard any sirens. But whenever she heard sirens later on in life, probably including now, um, there was a kind of a real trigger of anxiety. And so it became kind of an um, interest that she kept digging deeper into and really deep listening of what does that mean? And I think it's so important right now because we all have, we don't hear a lot of the sirens, but we're somehow feeling it and sensing it. And I think there's something to be looked at collectively when we're talking about what's going on right now in the world that we kind of know about, but we are don't, we don't uh, really f sense it. Um, she is the assistant director of the Arts Eye Center, so she's working with us very much on this Getty project right now, and um, it's all about sound, and that's what her thesis is, which she just uh, finished showing her thesis project at Yale. So she's here, she came here from Yale. Uh, she's here for just two, three days, and we're excited to have her. And please welcome Ivana Dama. Okay, so we switch. No, you're cute. That's mine. So oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. So I'm just going to take I'll connect it. I got it. Welcome, Eva. Thank you. I'm going to have to check the resolution again because I got the plug right. Yeah. Just switch to print. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Victoria, for the introduction. And I keep remembering that some of you are here for the class, so I'll try to uh, to keep the educational role as well. Um, I am, as Victoria mentioned, I'm primarily a sound artist. I also do um, all different kinds of work, including a sculptural work and including um, the work that exists on the web and, and in web-based applications. So I'm trying to not kind of focus myself on on a specific mediums, but I I tend to 
uh, to jump from disciplines and also work with scientists and quite often like don't like to label myself in, in, in a discipline specific uh, work. Uh, so I will start by sharing that I actually graduated from this department a few years back and I uh, met most of you, uh, some of you uh, I met through design media arts department here at UCLA. I, I also graduated from the program in informational science in digital humanities that I often forget to mention, but uh, they're very supportive of my uh, work, especially recent research, so I'm trying to remember to say that every time as well. And um, recently, almost actually in next month or so, I will be graduating from Yale MFA program in sculpture. And I remember when I got accepted to that program that I told one of my close friends who went with me to undergrad here, and um, she told me, what do you mean sculpture? Like, you never made a sculpture. Like, how did I accept you? Um, so I kind of convinced the committee of my faculty at Yale that sound should be consider it as a sculpture because it takes physical space. And um, so they were convinced and I joined the program. Um, I will cover some of the projects that I think are important for this class mostly. So I, um, I'm not sharing things necessarily uh, chronologically today, um, but I will also um, probably skip through uh, certain parts of my uh, work that are like maybe three or four years. Um, and so if I go too quickly through some of the work at the end, feel free to kind of put me back to some projects that I didn't explain as well. Uh, and, and just before I start, I'm also going to mention that um, a few uh, works that I'll be sharing, uh, for some of them I am uh, focusing also on the process part of how the work was made and not just the final image. So uh, for maybe two or three pieces, I will also share uh, kind of the backside of, of, of how the work was made, uh, which is not <laughs> what we usually do as artists. Um, and so I'm going to start with a work from, um, and I'm very tall, and I feel like this setup, I just uh, have to <laughs> make it a little t even taller, but I, I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, you will pick me up. Okay. Yeah. You, you hear me well now? Okay. So it was too close to... Okay, great. So it's like, why is this so... I, I can't extend like this. I'm, um, I am tall, but like not that. Uh, so um, I will start with this work from uh, 2018, and it's really the project that I really share right now, but I, I do think it's important uh, for the context of the work that I'm... I'm, I'm primarily working at the moment. Uh, this project was called Home 1999, and it was the project that I made um, actually at Community College, at Santa Monica Community College, and um, I was looking into U.S. Geological Survey website um, that was showing the satellite images. And I opened that website and I typed in, um, f there was a section that you can search based on the date uh, and search based on location. So in the location element, I typed in Belgrade and then I typed in my birthday in 1999, um, which I remember being one of the days of bombing. So I started opening these images of um, satellite scanning um, over the land uh, of my hometown and started noticing some uh, interesting uh, patterns uh, emerging. So on the, on the panel that is on the very bottom is actually the first uh, day of bombing where you can clearly see the land and you can see the rivers and mountains and clearly see the position of the city. And especially if you're familiar with that uh, region, you can kind of um, definitely place yourself ge geographically on the, that map. And on the panel on the very top is the last day of bombing. So I was really interested in how um, there was so much dust in the clouds that was covering probably the, the technology at that time that satellites used. So these clouds are covering the area so it wasn't, the images are not clear of the land. So I didn't know if it was an accident or if, if it was actually um, a part of the kind of like maybe the concrete dust or something else was in, in the clouds that it was uh, enabling the, the technology to take the images of that. In this work, I was sort of interested in, uh, it was the first time working in a topic of like my autobiographical events and kind of incorporating them in my work. 
And it was, I remember being really, feeling really strange when I started working on this because I felt like I was cheating. I, I was invited to be in a show that was featuring women artists who grew up in war-torn countries. And I was like, I really didn't. I was like really young to remember anything. Um, so I started kind of like questioning myself whether I should be part of events like that. And I kind of also doing like identity based work wasn't something that was accepted as well. And it was like with my, at least my classmates, it was like, oh, you're using that almost as like a leverage to get more attention to your work or something. So I was kind of really questioning and avoiding, to be honest, to work with this topic. Uh, but then I kept going back to it and, and, um, and actually sound was something that was more important than any visual elements. So in this work, although it's very vi visual and very static, work, um, I was kind of primarily interested in the perspective, not from which I saw the events, but from perspective from which uh, foreign military pilots would see the land as they were uh, crossing. And uh, there's some process images of this uh, anodized aluminum being engraved with a laser, and uh, the laser uh, would kind of scratch the surface very lightly, so as you're removing the the panels, they would have a layer of dust on them. So I was kind of interested in replicating that um, dust that I remember of um, kind of like the early memories of like leaving these shelters and seeing like surfaces of everything like uh, stairs and everything in a, in a public outdoor spaces was covered with a thin layer of dust. So I kind of wanted to replicate that. Um, and these are some close up images of that. And now jumping like kind of forward in a couple of years after that. Um, and this is actually not even an artwork, but it's more an experiment. And I, I think that is a really important part of my practice is having like silly experiment moments. And um, this is with Dylan Bastian, who was also a student at Design Media Arts Department at the time. And we took the theory class uh, with Peter Lunifeld, who is a professor here in the department. But Peter allowed us, usually you have to write the like probably some of you know, you have to write um, research paper for that class, but Peter allowed us to do a final that was practical instead of doing like a sort of like a project experiment or something. So in a less than a day or two, um, we were predicting instead of writing a research paper, we wrote, uh, we created a speculative project that was reflecting on what is the next technology after VR and AR, and we called our project Emotional Reality. Um, so essentially in this work, um, and I will play it. Yeah. Uh, I don't necessarily need it for this one, but I would need it for future ones. Is it, is it turned out? Mm, I see what's going on. So I will, I will talk over, so while Garrett is helping um, to fix this, uh, the basic idea for this project was uh, how can one person's em emotion uh, be read by a computer and then activate muscles on the other person and force the other person to repeat that emotion. Um, so this kind of idea, I was obs obsessed with the sort of idea of control and in and, and relationship to body. And um, we started exploring how can image reading software uh, be used with the uh, electron muscle stimulation technology that's usually used for abs. Like, I don't know if you remember those commercials in 90s and like, I don't know, like early 2000s of it. Like, you'll get a six pack if you elect like electrify yourself a little more. So, um, we used we use the same, we kind of like took one on, bought one on Amazon and, and, and we use the relay that, and the sound that you hear is the sound of, uh, thank you guys, um, is the sound of a relay triggering something. So as I said, it wasn't really a project, but I, I, I do think that this part of my practice is quite um, important and sometimes 
uh, larger projects and collaborations emerge out of it. Um, so I will kind of skip through um, some projects really quickly, but uh, I want to say that we were talking about potential use in teenage discipline, in military um, espionage, and um, long distance uh, couple relationships and whatnot. So we had like a whole list of uh, possible uses for this. Um, so it was kind of a uh, interesting project. And then this was actually my, um, uh, not a thesis, but my capstone work at UCLA and it was called uh, Command and Control. Uh, the, pr the project was uh, tracking um, my, using the pupil tracking, uh, custom pupil tracking software to map um, the darkest point of everyone's eyes is a pupil. And if you, um, I was kind of interested to, um, even, even when I was very little, I was, I've always wanted to see something in front of me and then move it by looking at it instead of touching it. Um, so that kind of started the project, a kind of basic, uh, <laughs> like again, silly thought, but then kind of extended into into larger concepts. So I started thinking of how much we we have, um, how much we have in our sort of like how much we take for granted our eye movement and how much we think we're in charge of controlling. Um, controlling with um, controlling our eye mu movement, or we can see things, um, or be kind of like aware of things around us. So I started, I started kind of like spiraling and thinking about all of these things. But then, every there's some involuntary parts of our body, including the blinking. So you can only go so far without blinking. At some point, you 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 have to blink. So I started thinking of creating a. Um, I will play the video so it explains it better. Um, but sort of starting a, a project where I would be um, on the stage performing live and uh, there was a, a web camera tracking my, my pupil. And the whole, the whole project was very um, DIY made in my backyard. At that time I lived in Topanga Canyon in uh, California. So. Uh, fabrication shops were closed uh, due to beginning of pandemic and also the theater where I performed this was completely empty. Um, so I will play this and then I will talk a little more after. <laughs> Every five minutes or so, if you're doing this, like you, your eyes become really tired and you need to take a break. Um, so I'm always thinking about how much like being focused on such a thing that we don't really think about usually like forces us to have this like exhaustion. Similar goes to breathing and, and other things. Um, but that project was called Command and, uh, the project that I showed earlier was called Command and Control. And then um, when I started um, Yale, I made a project called Com Control and Freedom. <laughs> so this idea of, I remember being uh, in an interview for schools and uh, when I was applying for graduate programs and one of the professors who is now my thesis advisor asked me, why are you obsessed with control? And I was like, I, had, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't see it at that moment, uh, but probably, and I didn't know how to respond, um, but probably the lack of control as a, as a child of seeing, and also not, not just during the time of bombing, but also seeing the situation in political situation in, in the Balkans in general and like ex-Yugoslavian countries, there was like very uh, much a feeling of lack of control. And 
and and sort of um, and seeing things unfold in front of your eyes and not being able to change them or affect them, and um, that's sort of um, the the sort of a feeling that kind of caused maybe my work to be oriented towards that. Um, I also did, like I'm not gonna share some of these projects, but I also did a lot of work related to um, nuclear spaces and actually one of the, 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 the documentary movies about accidental nuclear explosions uh, was called Command and Control and I renamed the work based on that documentary. Um, so, I will switch to the, the next work that is uh, that was installed in the basement out of all places in the building where, um, where my studio is at Yale. Um, so I was interested in kind of replicating um, or thinking about like the uh, Kafka, uh, Franz Kafka and his book called Process in Europe in here is called Trial, the trial. And where the main character is um, constantly trying to f figure out in these levels of bureaucracy what he did wrong, but it was like always hard be because um, every time he would knock on a door and try to find out there was like another layer, another layer, another layer. So it's a confusion of, of multiple levels and I wanted to create a work that is not a performance, that is not a um, installation, that is not a sculpture, um, and that is kind of a situational work, uh, looking back into uh, sort of a term that was used happening um, in the 70s, um, and so kind of like looking into creating a situation where my cohort was put in this kind of weird DMV-like office. Uh, so I invited everyone for the for, to come to the cri critique space and I, they had appointment times and everyone's appointment time was slightly different. And the system would call out the time um, and whoever the person with the specific number that would match uh, would have to go and talk to the window that you saw in a previous image. Um, I was really like, in, in this work, I was really interested in confusing persons, trying to confuse persons' identity, trying to confuse. So you would, at the beginning, you would ask them questions to confirm who they are. Also, relationship to time. So the clocks that you see in the, on the walls on, in the back, they are going faster than the regular clocks. And they, so if you are mismatching your appointment time, you have to go back and wait for your actual appointment time, but then the time is going faster, so you don't really know how much you're gonna wait. Um, and so it usually something like, like if you get like, I don't know, it was like, a, like a, it's hard project to explain, especially without a video. And I had to give up on my video documentation because it's a consent uh, form that some people didn't agree to share. Uh, and a lot of a lot of people participants share their pri private information, so it's hard to to share that. Um, then at the end of the sort of like this circle, uh, they had to fill in the form that was called evidence of self, and some of the questions on their form uh, were actually unanswerable. So they were uh, sort of a questions like almost more philosophical. Have you ever loved? And maybe you can answer yes or no with a certainty, but you maybe never know that answer. And, or have you ever disappointed a person that you love was another question. So it's like another layer of, of, um, of sort of like unanswerableness, <laughs> if, if that's a word at all. Uh, so I was kind of exploring that, but more, um, I'm sharing these images more as a format of the work that took place and kind of led to um, another work uh, that I titled, I don't know if you can hear us, although you're being very loud. And um, I actually um, was uh, moved, uh, I lived in California for almost 10 years in Los Angeles and I moved to Connecticut that is a very different uh, place um, politically. And so every day when I'm going, I was driving to school, I had to pass by this uh, Planned Parenthood house and, uh, and see like um, different uh, people protesting uh, who are 
um, usually also like Trump supporters and um, and sort of like um, trying to ban abortion laws in in such a specific state like Connecticut that was like very um, swing between. So I was um, I was like seeing all these images and passing through them, but I didn't know how. And I've wanted to make a work about it, but I again like didn't really know how to approach it. So I was uh, I created this egg uh, timer uh, that that is uh, rewinding itself. So as it goes back to zero, it kind of goes back to. 10 minutes and then starts counting down again. But every time it rings, you're not able to hear it um, because it's placed inside of the vacuum chamber. And vacuum chamber is um, just a, a simple um, acrylic box and, um, and it's completely sealed. So on the top part is a, a milled silicone. And, um, it, and then it has a tube that is connected to the vacuum pump. So it's it's an industrial vacuum pump and it removes the air from the box and every time the 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 egg would ring and it would you would expect to hear that specific uh, sound of the egg timer, um, it would actually be completely silent. Um, so I was interested in how um, because the sound waves uh, require a medium. Um, for for sound to travel, so so I was interested if I remove that, um, it's almost like if you yell in a space, no one can hear you because there is no um, no air in the in the space. Um, so I kind of started thinking about how these almost like oppressive uh, regimes are trying to silence women's voices and kind of replicate that in in this work. Um, I will jump into um, another work that I did using same concept. Um, so I started thinking I was really like, um, the first project that I showed with Egg Timer was kind of a side experiment that I did not for even a, a critique or a class. It was, it was just, I felt like I had to do something. And the work that I'm sharing now uh, was the work that I uh, kind of developed a little further. So I brought uh, the air raid sirens. So the the objects uh, were now almost artifacts that are inside of the boxes are the air raid sirens that are used uh, to signal bombing in my hometown. Uh, so somewhere about 20 years after the events, um, government of Serbia decided to activate all the sirens again. And the same night, a lot of people had heart attacks and it was a quite, um, quite traumatic experience for a lot of citizens. So they decided to replace the, the, the sirens in the city in, in, during the pandemic. And my dad saved some of these sirens for me. So I have now a total about like 50 of the sirens. Uh, and I, every time I go back to Belgrade, I bring some of them in my suitcase. So um, I usually do like two or no more than two every, every trip. Uh, so I now have about like 10 or 15 sirens in my studio in New Haven. Um, but I uh, activated these sirens. They're really loud to a point that they can hear, that hurt your hearing if you're next to one of them. And, but they're so small and um, a little heavy, but like not too heavy. So I started thinking like, what should I do with these sirens? I wanna make a project with them, but I will be kicked out of the building. There's no gallery that can show the work like that. And I was like, oh, it makes sense to connect that to a project I was doing before and to actually try to silence them. But the egg timer is such a specific um, small, sound that it makes so that it's not actually as loud as, as these ones are. So I started thinking there's no way that this is going to work because it's so much louder. Um, so I realized that I have to think about vibrations and like how actually the surface, uh, like touching the acrylic box would also transfer the sound. So I use some of the the some, some holders that are holding the siren itself are made of rubber and they're absorbing um, some vibrations, not everything, but most of it. Um, so I'm gonna share the video. Oh, right before I share the video of this project, um, I'm, I'll try to explain uh, a little more on the 
I was showing this work to um, my faculty members and asking them for feedback, and they were like, but most people don't even know that this is an air raid siren inside, so you, you trying to silence it perfectly um, might not create the, the type of um, effect that you want, so people most likely won't even know what is inside. Um, so I added, I decided to add the control valve, and that's the object that you see on the right side. Um, so this is the control valve on a timer. So every 10 minutes, this would open, almost like a little solenoid motor would lift up and open the valve, so the air comes back inside. So as the air comes back inside, you slowly hear the sirens um, going, the sound coming up and then the valve closes, and then the vacuum pump starts working to remove the air. Um, so it was almost like a feedback loop between, um, between the two sirens. Um, so I'll play the video, the do six pounds better. Is made in Yugoslavia and that country doesn't exist anymore. So now the pump is removing the air. And as the pump stops working, there is a little s silence for a few seconds. And the air comes back in. So in, 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 in this project, it was kind of like continuously repeating the same process over and over again. And I kind of like think that um, the historical events and unfortunately the, the, the war situations and even the, the sirens that are signaling other things than, than war, like the um, hurricane sirens and um, and earthquake sirens. Um, so all of these like ecological and social and political issues are, um, are kind of connected and, so, and they're repeating itself. So I was thinking about that feedback loop as, as kind of repetitive process. And now I'm jumping into um, a, a project that uh, is part of my thesis. That's something that Victoria mentioned. Uh, so I started looking into um, Harvard's collection of uh, s historical scientific instruments uh, at Harvard University. And I noticed that uh, they had a collection of siren disks. And I thought, I didn't really notice that they were actual air raid sirens. And I started researching a little more about these um, objects and and they, they work very, like simple, they're very simple technologies developed in 1800s um, in Paris and Rudolf Koenig and Oppelt was actually inventor and then he worked with Rudolf Koenig who was a maker and had this wonderful workshop in, in Paris or like fabrication place in Paris that he would actually fabricate these. Um, so I became obsessed with these um, instruments and I went to visit a uh, collection itself and and I, it's a special collection, so I asked them to um, to show me the original discs. They're made of cardboard, so they're super light, and they have a, uh, they have about 15 of them in the collection. Some of them, somebody <laughs> when I posted this on my Instagram, somebody thought it was a pizza slice or something. Um, but they're about. They're about the uh, size of, of, of kind of like a medium-sized pizza, and the smaller ones on the on the left side um, are uh, are about f less than six inches, as we can see on this image. Um, so as I was visiting the collection, I really wanted to hear one of them, but because they're historical um, artifacts from 1800s, they of course don't demonstrate them. Um, in the collection. So I decided to um, go back to my studio 
And I quickly, this is all happening in like a one day, I like went to see this collection. I was like, this is so exciting. So if you, the idea is that if you spin one of the discs and you blow the air through it, that you would activate the sound. Um, so I did the same and I, I went to back to my studio and I laser cut one um, sheet of acrylic, acrylic and I went to the lab where I make most of my work, which is actually in chemistry department and in f physics and chemistry department, it's a machining shop. Um, so I, I, I uh, spin one of the discs on a lathe uh, that's used for other things, but uh, um, you've worked for this too. And we use the 30 revolutions per minute um, was the speed. And um, and on what I'm holding in my hand is an air compressor. Um, so. <laughs> So this is a professor who retired um, a few years ago um, and uh, loves my work and uh, is still they're letting him use the the shop. He's such a great fabricator. So we we um, he was helping me experiment with these and I came back six hours later. Um, totally forgot that I left my uh, my key to enter the building or something, and I'm coming back and I'm seeing him play with one of them, which was really cute. I wish I recorded it. Um, but I started bringing all different kinds of variations to to his lab, and every week I would bring different materials like cardboard and different kinds of acrylics, different thicknesses, different patterns, and it it became this. Uh, a really long project to test because everything was sort of, we had these steps like you would have to make a prototype and then go and test one specific thing. But then I was also around all these scientists who who actually um, had uh, amazing suggestions and every one of their suggestions was my new test. Um, so some of them would prove to work better than the others. And uh, essentially I wanted to make um, I, at the same time, I had to propose to the gallery uh, what is my thesis project going to be. So I wanted to create like almost like a large um, uh, rotating disc, uh, sort of similar to record player, uh, where um, the it would be activated, the sound would be activated by the air that kind of uh, that. Um, goes through the holes on openings on the disc. So this was my proposal at that time, and then I told the scientists that I was trying to make it almost five feet uh, wide, and they all had like, oh, there's no way that you can keep it stable, it's gonna move a lot, and, 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 and you can't find a, a material that is light enough to spin that fast, and then the motor is gonna be loud. So there was all these technical issues that were kind of like red flags, but we started solving one by one. And um, I, like now, like I think this was like a month later since the image of like proposal or um, so two months later, um, this was the actual installation in the gallery. Um, there were some changes that I had to make based because of the safety of the audience. Um, the environmental safety and health department at Yale required to have a step that was seven inches tall that would prevent people from kind of stepping in during the performance. And on the wall, I had uh, different variations of, of the patterns on, on the disc. And uh, when I initially started working on this, I realized that the pattern on each disc can be absolutely anything. It can um, range from, um, from sort of a more abstract, um, uh, variations of the the spacing on the holes, but it can be also very specific. So um, I started thinking like, oh, this can possibly be a Morse code. This can possibly be a, a Braille or any kind of like uh, other coding or meaning. So I started thinking what each disc, um, what what I would focus on when I'm making this disc, and I was really like struggling to find. Like I was like, okay. 
you know, or originally I wanted to have one specific disc and I was like, oh, it has to be about something that's important to me. And I really like started pressuring myself of what is that that is important. Um, so I started thinking like, how do I open this project up instead of closing it down? And how do some of my personal interests um, can also be a playground for other people. Um, and I also thought about uh, what are the things that I miss the most um, after spending like two years in a program that was very uh, oriented towards yourself, getting an MFA is all about you. And I really missed working and collaborating with other people. So I started thinking like, what if I reach out to uh, to friends that I either worked with in the past or that I was planning to work in the future. So I started sending emails to about 10 uh, friends who are, who are sound artists and I asked them what is the urgency for them and they all responded um, which to my surprise that they wanted to be part of the project and uh, for my thesis I did two uh, different performances with two different uh, uh, two different artists, and one of them was focusing on racial issues. The other person was focusing on uh, ocean and on the ocean pollution and like ecological issues. So, um, as the project is sort of growing, the important part for me was not to have a, a thesis as like a culmination or like this final thing. Um, um, but instead to have a project that is kind of generate, generating other work and like kind of growing from there. Um, so this is a, a performance with Robert Aiki, who I met um, actually about nine years ago and who introduced me to electronic music. Um, so Robert and I, uh, I walked by a store in Brooklyn called Control out of every title, that, that, out of every name that a store can be called is actually called Control, and I just realized that. Um, but they passed by that store and it was really interesting inside, it was like these modular synthesizers. At the time I didn't know what these are and I passed by and I walked in I asked them briefly, like, what is this? And they're like, oh, these are modular synthesizers. Pretty much like everyone inside was kind of not really interested in why I was there. And they were like, just look it up and come back. Um, but I kept like asking questions and I told them that I was using some softwares that were kind of using similar logic. And I was like, I feel like I can understand the logic of these synthesizers, but I didn't know really why. And then Robert was kind enough to, uh, to show me um, to show me actually the 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 instruments itself and how they work, and I spent like almost six seven hours in that store, and we became good friends after. And he's kind of like my mentor and the person that in introduced me to electronic music. Um, but I always always uh, treated my interest in synthesizers, specifically analog uh, synthesizers, as something so separate than my practice in. Um, in art. So I always thought like, okay, this is my hobby and other interests. And then I never really connected it to the work that I was doing. And I'll share um, this video shortly of us performing together. And it, it was about 10 or 13 minute performance, but I'll just share the very beginning.
tips. And so I'm going to lower down the sound. Um, and so every performer that I would reach out to had a completely different approach to how how to approach the, pr the project and same parameters or same restrictions. So for Robert, it was really important to have the sound of the actual compressor being amplified. So he really wanted to uh, keep the pressure up, he, although the, the, the siren didn't really need it. The, like the lower the pressure, the more like kind of melodic sound was. But Robert works is a noise artist and it was really important to him that it sounds like almost like a storm and that there is this like, like the strong air coming through through them and then I also did another performance with Ross uh, that um, and also I just have to mention that the documentation is not edited I just got these from the videographer um, so I don't have edited version of this project but we had uh, multiple recorders in the space because it would sound very different depending on how far you are and the sound that you're hearing right now is from the camera that's really far in the back. Um, so it's not ideal, um, ideal uh, representation of what it actually sounded like. Um, but I, I started thinking of how uh, sort of growing this collection of discs also changed the material of the project. So right now I continue to work on, on, on this project and I'm actually working with Victoria Shen and she wants to, she's a sound artist um, as well and she wants to make a, 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 a disc that is uh, dissolving as the air touches it. Uh, so it would kind of disappear by the end of performance. So now the kind of the project is taking off in a whole other direction which was very interesting to me that maybe every city or every place that I'm showing this project in would completely take it into a different um, a different sort of a direction um, and I will um, I will share I, I don't like to to end the presentation of the kind of the work that I just did a few weeks back uh, I wanted to share um, a poem that I read that kind of inspired uh, the work that I'm currently working on and um, it's very simple um, but in in a lot of senses powerful and it's by Palestinian poet um, it, it's, um, I'm going to read it. Um, in order for me to write a poetry that is unpolitical, I must listen to the birds. And in order to hear the birds, the warplanes must be silent. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a project proposal. And I recently actually made this. And I, of course, don't have documentation uh, yet. But um, it's the sort of a project that uh, uses the, the the bird movements, the the drones, and um, and sort of security gates that's used on the borders. Uh, so it's interactive work uh, that is installed right now at the Schwarzman Center at Yale University. Um, and right in time before my battery expires, so we're <laughs> living dangerously. Uh, but yeah, thank you, everyone. I'll, I'll just I. I hope so. Let's see. Oh, yeah, it's here. Was that seriously your last slide? Maybe, but I will. Okay, I will. Uh, yeah, I will share a few more things, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for coming, and um, I'm open for questions now. Yeah, yeah, perfect timing. Thank you. So as I mentioned, the, the process is kind of really important to me. So I spend a lot of time um, learning uh, how to make things at, at, uh, actually at Yale. And I didn't know how to work with metal before. So instead of making, I don't know, a small keychain or something, I started uh, actually working with a steel controller with the rusted steel. So I spent a lot of time um, grinding this uh, box and like, I'm still working on this. It's like an endless project. Uh, but I was obsessed with, uh, with buttons and hardware and hardware components in relationship to uh, the functionality of things. So uh, for some of the future projects, I really want to make a large button. So I'm al always thinking like how small buttons make you jump from something 
uh, from zero to 100 really fast. So I want to make something that's really large so that you have like this precision of moving and how hardware can actually um, affect um, components of, of things. I also made my own synthesizers and this is, um, this is one of the synthesizers that I recently made. And I worked, um, I used the late that I showed earlier to make these buttons and knobs. So every part is like hand, not handmade, but mach in machining shop made. And like I screen printed on top. Um, so I have a lot of, yeah, a lot of interest and in projects that are sort of, I'm sort of treating them separately. Um, but they're really like, it's all one thing. So, um, yeah, I will, I will share a few more things, but I want to I wanna open it up for questions. <laughs> yeah, this is a EMS Sinti. It's um, uh, one of uh, very few still functioning in the world, uh, synthesizers, analog synthesizers. And it uses, um, it uses almost like capacitors. Um, instead of patching with two cables, you close the circuit by uh, picking something on the left side. Let me see if I have a better picture of, oh, I don't, oh yes, here. So it's like a battle battleship game. So you pick, for example, you want a noise generator, you want to add some reverb on it, that's where you place your capacitor. Uh, if you want to use oscillator two, it has, I think, eight or nine oscillators, um, nine oscillators. And you can, um, it's such an interesting synthesizer and I was really uh, obsessed with it and you can add filters, envelope shapers, um, again, reverb, and then you would send it off to channels. So you can have a channel sound and like use, um, use this part for outputs to send it off. Um, so I started, uh, started thinking that this was like completely separate from my practice. And then I will show, show you, I think it's somewhere on my website. Here it is. So I to totally didn't see any connection between this and a raid sirens. is changing just one oscillator without an, uh, any uh, filters or anything. Uh, it creates a it almost exact sound as the A-rate siren. Um, and then I, I, Victoria sent me actually this documentary. Um, so I'm just going to show one part of this documentary. Um, there was a charity. Oh, okay. Uh, there's an uh, <laughs> there's another documentary uh, called Sisters with Transistors, featuring um, pioneers in electronic music. And uh, Delia de Bashir was someone I really relate to in terms of my work. But it was always seen as like, oh, this is the woman that entered uh, the electronic music through sciences and da da da. And like, she worked in this uh, IBM lab and realized that same um, machines that you need to move atoms uh, are the same machines that you use to make sound. Um, so I will kind of fast forward to this 30 minute documentary and then the part that's really interesting to me is how she got interested in music.
I'll pause this documentary there, but um, to me it was really interesting that she was only four um, when Blitz was happening, and it's a different part of the world, so we're talking about UK. Um, so it was really important and um, important for me to see this because it wasn't anymore about my, my story. Uh, it became about this kind of larger research of air raid relationship of sonic memories, air raid sirens, in and also connections to electronic music and analog synthesizers. Um, so yeah, with that, I will end here. If you have questions, stay and ask. If if not, um, that's all. Thank you. Or comments, yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Yeah, I appreciate it. I I don't um, I don't have like a good answer. If I mean there was no specific question that you asked, but I really appreciate your references. I think it's very relevant. Beauty 
and the horrors that we face throughout our lives. And I see a lot of amazing art and come out of it in any form, whether it be a research paper or whether it be through the Dow we can see explored here. So my question for you is, do you think that to some extent horror is necessary in order to sort of open the self? Ouch. <laughs> I'm gonna walk out, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Uh, no, it's such a difficult question. Um, it's 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 absolutely you know I agree. Like I, I don't think if we live in a straight line um, that it, even if it's possible, I don't think it's good. Um, so I do think that 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 we, that we do need both sides. Um, I I don't necessarily. Um, I cannot frame it in a good way, but I do think that. Um, experiences that I went through, although I don't wish them for anyone, and I most certainly never will, but um, I do think that they changed me and made me, um, maybe the resilience is the word, or like the more, more, I don't know, like it, it changed me, definitely, and, and also not just me, but generation of, of, of kids um, like me. Um, so I do, I do think that, that there is some connection to that. But uh, yeah, the, <laughs> tough question. Um, yeah, especially when it comes to what's happening right now, there's a constant like kind of, I, the idea of suffering is really seen philosophically very different. And like in Stoicism, suffering is like, like part of the, it's, it's actually seen as a good thing and you kind of like overcome the more difficult parts are in front of you, you're kind of becoming stronger. So there's like different approaches and like philosophies um, that even Buddhism deals with this in a different way. So I think every every aspect I can see it from multiple perspectives. I don't know personally if um, if suffering is always necessary, um, but I I do think um, yeah I do think it's well. I'm, I'm losing my my thoughts, but I do think that um, it definitely changes you, and it make yeah it does make good grow possible. So it's painful when we are even growing up physically, but it you know it, it later you appreciate it. So yeah, I appreciate your question, but I also appreciate your perspective that you brought to a question as well. Um, so yeah, I feel like I agree with you, but I also can't say that with a pure confidence because of what's going on right now. Okay. <laughs> I I don't think it's like black and white, like one or one or the other. I do think it's like a um, both ways. I do appreciate the moments of that I didn't really consider or think about these events or worked with them until 20 years later. Uh, so I think that that part of separation was important. And similarly, I was talking to recently to Anuradha Vikram, that is the curator of this exhibition that Victoria was mentioning. We were talking about video games and how uh, currently students and, and people are making video games as part of the artwork right now, but they, there's no maybe st enough of time of separation from there um, because they grow up with it and that's also part of the culture, so maybe like, I don't know, like, it's, it's hard to point thing, the things, but like separation is good and kind of giving the time to, to, to kind of absorb something is, is good. And I, I didn't answer your first part of the question, but uh, yeah, if you... Thank you, that's fantastic. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> um, as a species, we have evolved to follow sound. So sound brings your attention to something, if you will. Mm -hmm. So as a 360 degree sense, and something that you can't turn off, if you will, it's something 
that is intrinsic to us, and we have no need of it. If you will, there is no escape from self. It's it's everywhere, all of the time, for our entire existence. If you will. So the only way that we can avoid the problems associated with self is to hear, but not listen to self. And by that I mean that we could not focus on sound and try and block it out from the mental perspective because we can't do it physically anymore. Mm -hmm. So my question, if you will, associated with this is that is this has a parallel with art. So as a sound artist, you, you are revolutionary. You're at the forefront of art, if you will. And all art at one point was revolutionary, if you will. So the question I have is, is do you encounter resistance with people that don't look at you as an artist? And this is something that is strange and discomforting to them, and something that they would rather not encounter or, or don't think about. Thank you. Um, um, do, do I think that um, a lot of people don't consider this as art? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think I consider it art myself. <laughs> if that, make, um, that, that doesn't help at all. But I don't think that something um, that something has to be art or put on, on like, you know, to be recognized. Um, I do think that, that there's, like, meanings and levels to uh, approach to the, the, the work that we are doing. And um, I, I usually like start with like almost like obsession and these like kind of thinking as a as a child and playing and having fun with something and and exploring and then um some works that i'm doing have no meanings whatsoever like they're just like pure experiments and pure trial and error things and i think that's a lot of times scientists think in a similar realm that is just you try things out and maybe you discover something that's related to another thing but maybe it sits there for a while and makes sense way later um i i think the art world is very complicated place and i also think that sound art is not really a, a accepted in art world. I also don't like the term sound art in general. Um, but the be beginning of your comment was uh, sort of what I'm constantly thinking about in uh, relationship to, for example, John Cage and how he his approach was like, we hear all these noises, but we can separate them for tonal structure. And that's an internal, like almost like meditation and like what Pauline Oliveira's did later, like the deep listening, we can change the memory of the sound with the actual tonal structure and inside of ourselves and it's it's possible and i'm i'm kind of looking into that um clo like closely and practicing um practicing things myself as well um i think it's important to have listening practice and also um like he hearing the sounds around us all the time is overwhelming, but like focusing that hearing on particular sounds and like extracting them and understanding them differently is also um, evenly important. And it might not be seen as art, but it's, it certainly is in, yeah, in a larger context. Thank you for the question. I, uh, we'll talk more, but yeah, I do, do think it's, it's quite important. I recently read in Scientific American that there's a problem now with um, lack of response to alarms. Like it's, they actually call it alarm fatigue. And in particular for doctors who are constantly getting alarms and at some point, I just thought it starts getting meaningless. And I'm wondering if it's the same in war zones, where after a while, you're just in this noise. Mm -hmm. Because it's constant, right? You get alarms, you get the bombs, you get the dirt, and it's just so distracting. Yeah, and uh, also the the part of like hearing um, hearing police cars. If you're in an area, or I lived in Westwood, and there was like a hospital right next to um, next to me, and I was constantly. And after a month of living there, I stopped hearing it. 
Um, but then you separate from that. I, I moved to Topanga Canyon, and it was just absolute opposite. Like, if you hear one car in a month, it was like, what is going on? And so the, the soundscape changed your sensitivity of like how much you're exposed to it. Um, changes that so and but also you notice it only when you leave and come back um, so I think that similarly happened in in Serbia that people didn't notice that they were traumatized by these sirens until they didn't activate them for a long time and then they activated them again so that first kind of sound of hearing it again is kind of the the the, the moment of like anxiety and 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 connection I mean, it's really hard to do research on that because you, you to do uh, the research, you have to prove uh, elements of it. And usually, you have helicopters, or you have like there was a there was a study that they were doing like uh, houses that are under the, the the what is it called like electricity cables yes. are also a, a higher chance of having a cancer. Yes, that is true, but there is also other correlation that you don't see those cables in Beverly Hills, you don't see them. It's economic, it's social, it's, it's racial, like all these issues are going on at the same time. And so it's really hard to prove one specific field uh, and similar goes with the sound. So that's... Exactly. Exactly. I think the context, the meaning, and uh, associations and relationships are really, really important. And it's yeah, it's it's not like one way or another. Um, th that's why these like other practices are important because you can sort of not control but like have a more <laughs> sense of it or be more aware. Yeah, that's such a good question. I I um, I have a difficult time in music departments in general, and I apologize if one of you is from the music department. 
uh, it's more the approach of um, approach that is different. So um, it, it's very limiting in a lot of ways. And, and similar goes for arts. There's like a lot of limitations. Um, here at UCLA, there is a program called New Genre at um, in the fine arts program, and there's also a media arts program here. So it felt like I was belonging to programs like that, and then I was trying to apply to a uh, Yale MFA program, and more specifically, I was looking for Yale MFA not as just a stamp of approval, but it is traditional MFA school and seeing art, and I was curious if I can get in. I was like, I don't know if what I'm doing is art, I'm just curious. And then I was like looking and it's not, a f what I'm doing is not a photography, it's not a painting, it's not a graphic design. And so I was left with sculpture and I was like, okay, looking into who came out of the program and some of my good friends and collaborators graduated from there. And I was like, they don't really like make sculptures. Uh, David Roy, um, who is a great collaborator and friend and also part of Artside Collective, is working uh, with rockets and makes rockets. And for his interview, he walked in with a with a rocket in, in the space. Um, so I, think, I thought that there was something strange about that department particularly um, that I was seeing throughout the years. So I wanted to try and, and, and I had the weirdest interview ever there, uh, but it was kind of challenging in a good way. So uh, that's why I decided uh, to go uh, with the sculpture department. Uh, I also was looking into a program um, at Columbia that's called Sound Art. And when I was around the people who were making similar work or thinking in a similar realm as I was, I was like, I don't want to be here. I want to be around people who are doing different things. And when I went to visit Yale, it was, uh, they accept 10 people and each person gets a studio. It's kind of like a shared um, building between us. Every single student is completely different completely doing different things. So there's no connections in terms of aesthetics, no connections in terms of interest. And, and so it was, um, we learn more from each other. Uh, and uh, I needed more help in areas that I didn't know that I needed help in. I didn't know that I'm gonna get into this metal work. I didn't know, it. and I was helping others. So there was a classmate of mine who made my favorite piece in the teaser show. There was a, uh, he was inspired by my work and he had a, a smoke detector with a low empty battery in a space and it was beeping every once in a while, the battery would beep. But it was so, it was talking so much. It was so simple, I freaked out. I was like, okay, I'm doing all of this and you just show up with one empty battery smoke detector and like it's more powerful everyone talks about it it's like funny and like it has like all these other elements of like talks about it talks about like negligence and being able to ignore that sound because you're busy with other things and your house like you know the, there's just like social economical levels all of it embedded in just one empty battery uh, and also it's a durational piece so you don't know how long it's the battery going off and that's the exciting things about art uh, was also looking into community and who are the people around you and who are, who are the people influencing your work and, and vice versa. So yeah, that's maybe so the reason. Do you consider yourself, if I said you're a sculptor, I am almost a master of sculpture. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think about it, but I, I am, so it's weird. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, <laughs> I'll change it now. <laughs> yeah, there was a podcast uh, that I did uh, in Serbia, and they said, two weeks ago, we opened your website, it says interdisciplinary artist, and today when we were preparing, it says sound artist and researcher. Which one do you prefer? Which one do you prefer? And I was like, I keep changing it myself. I don't know what do you call myself. Sculptor. Yeah, there you go. Um, but that's also a question. So I feel like I've, I need to put something else. So I don't know. Like it's, uh, yeah, just sculptor. Um, yeah, but thank you for the question. I think it was something I personally struggle with because I was in, in 
in a moment of like going towards more, oops, more research-based work and doing a PhD and writing and academic. And then I also was between like, I really want to have fun and try and do these weird things that nobody cares about but me. Um, so <laughs> I chose the other route for now. I might go and do PhD at some other point. But yeah, for now, I just wanted to like have a practice, studio-based practice that um, means that you are really deeply trying things and, and experimenting, not just theoretically writing about them. And yeah, I agree. That's that's yeah. We should talk after. <laughs> Thank you. Oh no no go ahead yeah. I think it's a, a very specific question that you're asking, but it's also very broad at the same time. Uh, yeah, I do f consider f using air as a medium, like inst like if painters are using paint or something, like photographers and it, like whatever. I think that about air specifically as something that I've I kind of am deeply like involved with and like like considering as as like f like oh it's taking physical space as well. Um, so it, I do think about air source for this project as a changing uh, element, and not just in terms of movement and whatnot, but also changing in what it is coming from. Uh, so in the other performance that I did, um, 
So the, the air source was changing for every performance. For the one I shared with you was canned air and compressor air. Um, for the other one that I did with Ross was a, a mechanical uh, bellow. So you press with the feet and it feeds the, feeds the air. Um, for the next one that I'm doing is a fish pump for like aquariums. Um, and then I'm also doing another one um, with an artist that is interested in uh, breathing and like bodily rhythm. So we'll try to like Im constantly inflate this thing that we would squeeze from. So it will be like shared air that would be squeezed in, in parts. So I, I feel like it's just the beginning of like a larger um, collection of, uh, no collection, but like a larger project that has this collection of discs as part of it. I'm also thinking about the sleeve for the disc. Uh, and what information can be hold on on that, and and kind of how it, and also how to store the disc itself instead of just being on the wall, like creating like casing and sliding this disc. So I think it's like a longer, larger project. But air is something that's changeable based on the person that I'm working with and what sort of sources and how and the approach to air is that they they, they that it's important to them. So kind of bringing them into the project as well. But thank you for, for that.